Hello, the topic of this presentation will be an introduction to motor evaluation. In general, motor evaluation is divided into two main parts. Evaluation of the ocular motility and evaluation of the extraocular muscle balance. Nystagmus is also sometimes included as a part of the motor evaluation. The first part of the motor evaluation that we are going to discuss in this presentation is the ocular motility. In order to understand the ocular motility, we need to understand first what is meant by ocular motility, what are the positions of gaze, how do we test the ocular motility, what abnormalities do we see, and finally, how do we document these abnormalities. So what is ocular motility? Eye movements in general are divided into monoocular eye movement, also known as ductions, and binocular movements, which include the conjugate eye movement or versions and the disconjugate eye movements or vergences. Ductions are monoocular movements. They are tested by covering the other eye to test each eye separately. Version is a binocular movement in which both eyes move in the same direction. Vergence is a binocular movement in which both eyes move in opposite direction, adding convergence and divergence. So what are the positions of gaze where we examine the ocular motility? In general, positions of gaze can be divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary positions. They can also be divided into cardinal and midline positions. The primary position is the position of the eyes in the straight ahead. While it is not a part of the ocular motility examination, it is probably the most important gaze position. The secondary positions are the positions of the eye in the four principal directions. So when the patient is looking upward, this is called elevation, or up gaze, or subduction or subreduction for monocular examination, or subversion or supraversion for binocular examination. When the patient is looking downward, this is called down gaze, or depression, or dear subversion or infraversion for binocular examination, or dear subduction or infraduction for monocular examination. When the patient is looking to the right, it's called right gaze, or dextroduction for monocular examination, or dextroversion for binocular examination. When the patient is looking to the left, this is called left gaze, or levoduction for monocular, and levoversion for binocular examination. And these are the four secondary positions of gaze. Then we have the four tertiary positions, which are the positions of the eye in the four oblique gazes. That is up and to the right, up and to the left, down and to the right, and down and to the left. So if we put the primary position with the four secondary positions and the four tertiary positions, now we have nine positions commonly known as the diagnostic positions of gaze. Another way for classifying the positions of gaze 
is dividing them into midline positions and cardinal positions. The midline positions are the positions of the globe in straight up gaze and straight down gaze. The cardinal positions are the positions of the globe where only one muscle in each eye is working to put the globe in this gaze position. So for example, when the patient is looking up and to the right, the right superior rectus is moving the globe up. When the patient is looking straight to the right, the right lateral rectus is moving the globe to the right. And when the patient is looking down and to the right, the right inferior rectus is the muscle that is rolling the eye down. On the other hand, when the patient is looking up and to the left, the right inferior oblique muscle is the muscle which is moving the globe up. And when the patient is looking to the left, the right medial rectus is the one which is moving the globe medially. And in down and to the left, the right superior oblique muscle is the muscle which is rolling the globe down. On the other hand, when the patient is looking up and to the right, it is the left inferior oblique muscle which is rolling the globe up. And when the patient is looking to the right, it is the left medial rectus which is moving the globe medially. And when the patient is looking down and to the right, it is the left superior oblique which is moving the globe down. On looking up and to the left, it is the left superior rectus muscle which is rolling the globe up. On looking to the left, it is the left lateral rectus muscle which is moving the globe laterally. And on looking down and to the left, it is the left inferior rectus which is rolling the globe down. And so, in each cardinal position, only one muscle in each eye is responsible for putting the eye in this particular gaze position. And again, if you put the six cardinal positions of gaze and the midline and the primary positions, we get again the nine diagnostic positions of gaze. So the next step is how are we going to test the ocular motility? Tuctions and versions are tested in the same way, by letting the patient looking in each direction. This can be done by simply asking the patient to look in each gaze position while stabilizing his head. Or you can use a fixation target or a toy for the child to follow. In some children, you can use something with a sound for the child to follow and to attract his attention. In younger and uncooperative children, you can use the doll head maneuver to test the acromotility. This is done by simply moving the head opposite to the direction of the gaze being tested while keeping the fixation target in place. The vestibular system will simply move the eyes opposite to the direction of head movement. So what abnormalities do we see in ocular motility examination? These abnormalities include underaction and overaction of the extraocular muscles as well as other abnormalities. Underaction can be seen in both horizontal and cyclovertical muscles. It can be seen in both inductions and inversions. We will start with the horizontal gaze. Normally, the eyes should reach the end of the palpebral fissure, so that there is no clearer scene between the eyes and the canthi. If the eyes can only reach the vertical midline, it is called a minus 4 underaction. If the eyes cross the midline, but did not reach the end of the palpebral fissure, it is graded as minus 1, minus 2, or minus 3 underaction, depending on the degree of the underaction. Remember, this is a subjective score, so there is no exact point to discriminate or differentiate between a minus 1 and minus 2 underaction, for example, which is an important limitation to such grading systems. We will start with limitation of abductions, with examples for different grades of limitation. 
This is a patient with a minus one under action with only a small part of sclera seen on side gaze. And these are more severe forms of under action. And this is a minus four under action where the eyes only reach the vertical midline. Sometimes when the eyes does not reach even the midline, it is graded as minus five under action. The same grading system can be applied for grading the under action in abduction. The following are examples of for limitation of abductions of different grades. This is minus one under action with a small part of the sclera seen in side gaze. And these are more severe forms of under action. And finally, this is a minus four under action where the eyes only reach the vertical midline. Sometimes when the eye does not reach even the vertical midline, it is known as a minus five under action. Next is the under action of the cyclo vertical muscles that appear in oblique cases. Remember that we are testing the function of the cyclo vertical muscles as elevators or depressors in oblique gazes. We will start with the inferior oblique under action. The inferior oblique muscle is the elevator of the globe in adduction. So if the inferior oblique muscle cannot pull the globe all the way up in adduction, it's graded as minus one under action. The more the sphere the limitation of the elevation, the higher the grade of under action. If the eye cannot move beyond the horizontal midline, it is graded as a minus four under action. This is a minus one under action with mild limitation of elevation in a deduction. And these are more severe forms of limitation of elevation. And finally, this is a minus four under action where the eyes only reach the horizontal midline in adduction. When the eyes does not reach even the horizontal midline, this may be termed minus five under action. The superior oblique under action is similar, but it appears on depression on adduction. The superior oblique muscle is the depressor of the globe in adduction. So if the superior oblique muscle cannot depress all the way down in adduction, it is termed as minus one under action. The higher the limitation of depression in adduction, the higher the grade of under action. If the eyes can only reach the horizontal midline, it is termed with minus four under action. This is an example of a patient with a minus one superior oblique under action with mild limitation of depression in adduction. And these are more severe forms of superior oblique under action with more limitation of depression in adduction. And finally, this is a minus four under action where the eyes only reach the horizontal midline in adduction. The superior rectus muscle is the elevator of the globe in abduction. The superior rectus muscle is the elevator of the globe in abduction. So if the superior rectus muscle cannot elevate the globe all the way up in abduction, it is termed as a minus one under action. The more to severe the limitation of elevation in abduction, the higher the grade of under action. And again, if the eye cannot reach the horizontal midline, it is termed as a minus four under action. This is an example of minus one under action with mild limitation of elevation of the left globe in abduction. And these are more severe forms of limitation of elevation in abduction. And this is a minus four under action where the eyes only reach the horizontal midline on abduction. The inferior rectus muscle is the depressor of the globe in abduction. Normally the inferior rectus muscle should pull the globe all the way down in abduction. In minus one under action, there is mild limitation of depression of the globe in abduction. And the more the limitation of depression of abduction, the higher the grade of under action. If the eyes can only reach the horizontal midline, it is termed as a minus four under action. This is an example of a patient with a left inferior rectus under action with a mild limitation of depression of the left globe in abduction. And these are more severe forms of limitation of depression in abduction. And finally, this is a minus four under action where the eye can only reach the horizontal midline.
Overaction is the other abnormality that can be seen in ocular motility examination. Remember that overaction can be seen only for cyclovertical muscles, as one eye can be higher or lower than the other, but not for horizontal muscles, as it is hard to imagine where the globe would be if the medial rectus or the lateral rectus is overacting. It can only be seen in versions, as one eye would be higher or lower than the others, but not inductions. We will start with the inferior oblique overaction. The inferior oblique muscle is the elevator of the globe in adduction. So, if the inferior oblique muscle is overacting, it will pull the globe higher in adduction. The more the severe the elevation of the globe in adduction, the higher the grade of overaction. If the eye moves straight vertically up with no adduction at all, it is termed a plus 4 overaction. Again, remember that this is a subjective score. So there is no exact point to differentiate between plus 2 and plus 3 over action, for example. These are examples of different grades of inferior oblique over action. So this is a plus 1 over action with mild elevation of the globe in adduction. And these are more severe forms of over elevation of the globe in adduction. And finally, this is a plus 1 over action where the eye moves straight vertically up with no adduction at all. And when the eye moves up and out instead of being adducted, it is sometimes termed a plus 5 overaction. Superior oblique overaction is less common than inferior oblique overaction. The superior oblique muscle is the depressor of the globe in adduction. So if the superior oblique muscle is overacting, it will pull the globe further down in adduction. The more the severe the depression of the globe in adduction, the higher the grade of superior oblique overaction. And if the globe moves vertically down in adduction, it is sometimes termed a plus 4 overaction. These are examples for different grades of superior oblique overaction. This is a plus 1 overaction of the right superior oblique muscle with mild over depression of the right eye in adduction. And these are more severe forms of over depression in adduction. And finally, this is a plus 4 overaction with right eye moving vertically down in adduction. When the eye moves down and out instead of being adducted, it is sometimes termed a plus 5 overaction. So why do we have to do both ductions and versions? Ductions confirm the presence of underaction. In this patient, for example, there is some limitation of abduction on versions. However, there is improvement of the ocular motility on ductions, suggesting that this is not a true underaction. This patient, on the other hand, has limitation of abduction of the right globe in versions that did not improve on ductions, suggesting that this is a true underaction. Ductions and versions can also be used to differentiate paralytic from restrictive lesions. In the upper photo, for example, there is limitation of abduction of the right eye. This hypothetically can be due to a paralytic lesion, for example a right lateral rectus paralysis, or a restrictive lesion, for example a tightness of the right medial rectus muscle. However, even on ductions, there is no improvement of the abduction of the right globe, suggesting a restrictive lesion preventing abduction of the right eye even on duction. In the lower photo, there is a minus 2 limitation of abduction of the right eye. However, on duction testing, the brain sends extra impulses to the right lateral rectus muscle, resulting in improvement on abduction. The improvement in abduction is more in favor of a mild paralytic lesion that improved because of the extra impulses sent during duction testing. Versions are the only way for grading over action of cyclovertical muscles. As detecting and grading overaction cannot be seen in ductions, as it depends on comparing one eye to the other. Ductions can also be used to differentiate cross fixation from a true limitation. In this patient, for example, there is a limitation of abduction of both eyes due to cross fixation. Cross fixation means that the child prefers to look to what it is in the right field with the left eye and to look to the left field with the right eye, resulting in what looks like a limited abduction of both eyes. 
Cross fixation is particularly seen in infants with infantile esotropia of a large angle. This infant, for example, has an infantile esotropia with what looks like a limited abduction of both eyes on version testing. So in order to ensure that there is no underaction of abduction, you need to do abduction testing. This is best done by covering one eye and using a dull head maneuver to ensure that there is no limitation of abduction. While underaction and overaction are the most important abnormalities you need to look for, there are other changes that you need to look for in ocular motility examination. These abnormalities include Change in sensible pupil fissure weights, abnormal movements of the eye, abnormal movements of the eyelids and or the pupil, as well as nystagmus. Sometimes there are changes in the pupil fissure widths with eye movement. In this patient, there is limitation of abduction of the left globe. This limitation is associating to the mitering of the left pupil fissure suggesting a paralytic lesion to the left lateral rectus muscle. The widening of the palpebral fissure is due to absence of the muscle tone to the left lateral rectus muscle. This muscle tone is normally what pulls the globe slightly inward into the orbit. As a result of absence of the muscle tone, the globe will move slightly outward on case towards the paralyzed muscle, causing widening of the palpebral fissure. On the other hand, in restrictive lesions, the contraction of the muscle against a restriction results in retraction of the globe and narrowing of the palpebral fissure on case towards the side of limitation. In this patient, for example, there is limitation of a deduction of the left globe. This limitation is associated with narrowing of the palpebral fissure suggestive of a restrictive lesion on the left side. In this patient, there is limitation of abduction of the left eye with classical widening of the palpebral fissure on abduction and narrowing of the palpebral fissure on adduction suggestive of a left Twain syndrome. This is another patient with Twain syndrome. You can notice that there is narrowing of the palpebral fissure on adduction on both sides, suggestive of bilateral Twain syndrome. Abnormal eye movements are sometimes seen in ocular motility examination. This patient, for example, shows an abrupt elevation of the right globe on adduction, commonly known as upshoots, seen in patients with Twain syndrome. This is another patient with a left Twain syndrome showing abrupt elevation of the left globe on adduction. Sometimes there is abrupt downward movement of the global adduction known as a down shoot. Another abnormality that can be seen in ocular motility examination is changes in the eyelid position. In this patient, for example, there is distraction of the right upper eyelid in down grave. This is known as a pseudo von Grave sign as it mimics the von Grafstein seen in patients with dyscyroid of somnopathy. Nystagmus can also be elicited in ocular motility examination. In this patient, for example, there is a repetitive 
retraction and convergence of both globes on upgaze. This is known as a convergence retraction nystagmus. The final question is how are we going to document these abnormalities seen in ocular motility examination? We have to document the movements of the right and left eyes, both inductions and versions. The commonest way for documentation is using the tic-tac-toe plot. The tic-tac-toe plot is a well-known board game. We can use a similar plot to document the abnormalities seen in ocular motility examination. This patient, for example, has a minus 3 limitation of abduction of the left globe. So we put down a minus 3 in the square corresponding to the left lateral active muscle. And we put 0 in other squares indicating that there is no abnormalities in other muscles. Sometimes only abnormalities are recorded on the plot, and other squares are left blank, indicating that there are no abnormalities in other gaze directions. Overactions, on the other hand, are given a plus sign. This patient, for example, has a plus 2 overaction of the left inferior oblique muscle. So plus 2 is written in the square corresponding to the left inferior oblique muscle. In instances where we are not sure whether there is an underaction of the depressors of the left globe or an overaction of the depressors of the right globe, you can put a minus sign in the lower squares of the left globe indicating an underaction of the depressors of the left globe and a plus sign in the lower squares of the right globe indicating an overaction of the depressors of the right globe. Another plot that is sometimes used instead of the tic-tac-2 plot is the cardinal plot. The cardinal plot has place for documentation of the ocular motility only in the six cardinal positions for each eye. Under action is written as a dash sign where a one dash indicates minus one under action and four dashes indicate minus four under action. Overactions, on the other hand, are represented by an arrowhead, where one arrowhead represents a plus one overaction, and four arrowheads represent a plus four overaction. This patient, for example, has left lateral axis underaction minus three, so we put three dashes corresponding to the left lateral axis muscle. This patient has a plus two overaction of the left inferior oblique muscle, so we put two arrowheads corresponding to the left inferior oblique muscle. Remember, if you had other abnormalities, for example narrowing of the paper fissure, you have to write them down in the plot for documentation. So this is an example to sum up the ocular motility examination. In this example, we are going to start with the verges first, followed by the ductions. You can see in this patient mild narrowing of the left palpebral fissure on adduction and there is a minus 3 limitation of abduction of the left globe. So we are going to put 3 dashes here corresponding to the left lateral active muscle. In up and to the right there is a mild left inferior oblique overaction. So we are going to put 1 arrow height here. This is left case again showing the minus 3 limitation of abduction. Right case showing mild narrowing of the palpebral fissure. Down and to the right, there is nothing remarkable. Straight down, no abnormalities are seen. And down and to the left. Again, no abnormalities. Then we are going to carry on with the ductions. We will start with the ductions of the right eye followed by the left eye. This is the right eye, right gaze, left gaze, up and to the right. Straight up,
up onto the left down gear then down to the right and finally down to the left as there are no abnormalities seen we are going to put nothing on the plot now we are going to carry on with the actions of the left eye start with the right gaze which is normal then the left gaze there is a limitation of abduction of minus 3 so again we are going to put 3 dashes corresponding to the left lateral rectus muscle then up gaze is normal up and to the left up and to the right then the down gazes straight down gaze down to the right and finally down to the left no other abnormalities were seen thank you